Well, welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like to start today by asking those in the audience, do you enjoy wine? Good, good. Organizers, will you make sure that every single person with their hand up gets a free bottle of wine when we get done today? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, my name's Greg Jones, as uh, uh, the introduction said. And I'm here to talk to you about climate, grapes, and wine. But first, I'd like to uh, back up and talk about the importance of weather and climate in human history. We know that early civilizations, as they were developing, developed based upon strong agricultural systems that had to do with the climate, being able to allow them to grow a given crop. If the climate changed for one reason or another historically, they migrated, moved somewhere else, or decided to grow something or raise a different type of animal. So climate has been very important. And today, just like in the past, we know that climate influences everything we do in agriculture through controlling the suitability of a crop to a given area, through influencing quality and productivity, and ultimately driving economic sustainability uh, anywhere in the world. When we talk about climate and agriculture, we can typically talk about two broad categories, broad acre crops or specialty crops. The idea here is, is that these crops divide the system into how we see them geographically. While broadacre crops, such as corn, wheat, rice, and soybeans, be grown across a very wide geographic and therefore climatic range, specialty crops have a tendency to be grown over fairly narrow geographic areas and very narrow climate ranges. When I was a young PhD student uh, starting to look at studying climate and climatology, my advisors all suggested to me to study broadacre crops because they were very important for food security. However, I was uh, very much interested in the intricate and delicate nature of how climate uh, influenced growing specialty crops, um, especially when I was looking at something like viticulture and wine production. Uh, in this system, arguably climate is the most important factor to growing the crop and making wine. So as such, I went down this path to look at this system. Some people asked me, they said, this is a pretty superfluous uh, thing to study, alcohol, but alcohol has been with us uh, for, uh, uh, throughout history and has helped shape who we are. And so I thought that was a very interesting aspect of something to study. And wine, which, which embodies all kinds of characteristics associated with art and history, um, uh, gastronomy, romanticism, uh, science of all kinds, it was all tied up in this one agricultural pursuit. For me, it was just too rich of a system to, to not study. So that's where I uh, went down this path to become a wine climatologist. And I always say that somebody had to do it. <laughs> so I want to start here by uh, uh, talking about something we've learned over time about this term called terroir. Not terror, but terroir. Terroir is, uh, comes from the Latin terri or territory. Its first modern definition is based upon a stretch of, uh, of land limited by its agricultural capacity. And within the concept of terroir, it typically is trying to describe all of the factors that go into growing grapes and making wine. This includes the variety in terms of how it's being grown, but this also includes all of the natural factors such as climate, landscape, geology, and soil that go into growing grapes and making wine. However, there's a tremendous cultural aspect, too, where cultural factors are extremely important, uh, especially in, in terms of how we decide what variety goes where and how those wines are being made from the fruit grown in those vineyards. So the cultural component is extremely important. Now, of all the natural factors uh, that go into growing grapes and making wine, it is pretty clear that climate is the kind of the baseline expression that we can all uh, uh, kind of agree on and understand. And I think most of you as well in the audience, uh, the, the very baseline expression here is the difference between wine styles. We can all tell a wine that typically comes from a cool climate or a warm climate. Cool climate wines tend to be lighter, more subtle. They have uh, a, a higher acidity, very crisp. They tend to have bright fruit flavors. While wines that come from a warmer terroir have a tendency to be fuller, uh, deeper colored, uh, higher alcohol, and, and darker fruits. So we all know that, the, that this wine style framework is really being driven by climate. What happens with geology and soil is, is that they 
influence the overall subtle nature of those expressions within a given region or within a given vineyard. So it all plays an important role, but climate is the main driver here. The other component of this is, is that, that climate really is a, a strong driver in quality and productivity that happens within the terroir framework of things. So as I've been looking at this, terroir is an important kind of construct that we use to describe kind of what's happening within growing grapes and making wine. So this leads me to talk a little bit about relationships. Um, when we look at the overall framework of growing grapes and making wine, we know that it takes quite a bit to be able to produce a given crop uh, for high quality. We know we have to understand this, the, the structure of the climate in a given region, what that looks like in terms of growing season length and, and rainfall timing and extreme events. But we also need to know how that structure drives the suitability to any given variety grown there. But beyond structure and suitability, we also have to have a framework behind which we can understand how climate variability influences quality and productivity. But today, more than ever, we also need to understand how a changing climate influences all of this, whether it changes the structure in a given region, the suitability to varieties, and or the overall variability in a region is all very, very important. This is critical because wine grapes are a narrow specialty crop that, uh, uh, that are really prone to changes in climate overall. Um, so what I've been doing is trying to study what these, this framework is for wine grape production, not only globally, but also here locally within our region. So this leads me to the idea that some of you might say, uh, or be thinking about right now, the idea that is there an ideal climate for wine production? Well, I've been trying to study this for about 25 years or so now, and uh, I think we know some things that are worth sharing. Uh, number one, I've been looking at this concept behind what's called a climate niche. A, niche, uh, a climate niche is essentially the climatic environment that any organism, whether it be a plant or an animal, functions the best in. Um, for wine grapes, this basically means if you plant the right grape in the right place, you're going to get more consistent quality and more consistent productivity over the long term. Um, now, as we look at overall climate structures of places uh, worldwide, we know that climate in general is based upon what we all kind of lead to believe these Mediterranean climate structures out there in the world. Uh, and it's mostly, it's true because we have this history with Europe and we look at these areas and we try to understand what their framework is all about. But I can tell you that wine grapes are today grown across a huge range of mid-latitude zones that are very suitable to growing uh, quite a few different varieties. A matter of fact, hundreds of varieties can be grown across landscapes all over the world uh, to produce different wine styles. Some of these places are more suitable to uh, cooler climate varieties. Uh, some of them are more suitable to warmer climate varieties. But the overall framework here is, is that there's a rich amount of, uh, of, of, of varietal material that can be grown in different places throughout the world in terms of what we can produce. So a lot of this has led me to studying these aspects of these climate niches and trying to better understand what variety does best where and how. And in doing so, that's led me to this idea of suitability. Um, how can we understand suitability relative to any crop, let alone something as complex as uh, growing grapes and making wine? I collected data from places all over the world to try to best better understand this. And in doing so, I, I, I I have worked up to a, a diagram that's very useful to illustrate the concept here. Um, this diagram uh, is a representation of 21 of the most common varieties grown worldwide. You can pick out your favorite. And what it is, is it represents the climate niche of these varieties based upon where and how they can be grown best throughout the world. Um, I also have table grapes and raisins here just to put an upper bound on the whole framework uh, uh, of where the warmest areas are for grapevines. Um, two different things are being uh, shown here, and we'll get to a third in a moment. Uh, but the two different things are largely the climate type in which these varieties can be grown in, whether it's cool, intermediate, warm, or hot, but also um, uh, the potential wine style. And to describe that a little bit more, I want to talk about Pinot Noir. Most of you probably know Oregon's number one variety is Pinot Noir. Well, it can be grown over a fairly narrow climate niche of about four degrees Fahrenheit globally. And in doing so, on the cool end, we have places like Tasmania. On the warm end, we have places like the Russian River Valley. And in the middle, we have places like Burgundy and the Willamette Valley. What happens here is, is that Pinot Noir that's grown 
on the cool end tends to be a lighter bodied, lighter colored, more subtle wine. While it's grown on the warmer end, it tends to be a more fuller bodied, darker colored Pinot Noir wine. So that's the wine style potential that can happen in this framework. And, and if you really think about it, you could describe the same thing for any one of the varieties that's on this list. Uh, an, another aspect of this I think is important. You might be saying, well, can these varieties be grown outside these bounds? Yes, they can, and people do it. However, the climate is such that unreliable yields typically are produced, and then quality tends to be more questionable or sketchy, and so it's not a very marketable product. Within these bounds, you tend to be more consistent overall. Another way of looking at this uh, in terms of this diagram is to talk about regions. I uh, developed a concept uh, just looking at what I call the climatic envelope for a given region. So this is the essentially the coolest to the warmest places in a region and how it can ripen any variety. And we can talk about a couple of places. Here's Burgundy. Burgundy is um, a relatively cool climate area and grows mostly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And you can see why its climate envelope is basically central to that. We can also look at a warm climate place like Bordeaux. Bordeaux, a little bit, again, a little bit warmer. It's, can, it can ripen a, a different range of varieties and also produces a different range of styles. So that brings me to talk about uh, here. We're in the Umpqua Valley of Oregon, uh, a very prominent wine region in the state. Where is its climate niche and what does it look like? Well, it's basically somewhat in the middle of these two, uh, Burgundy and Bordeaux. And the framework here is you should be able to see right away that it's wider. Well, it's wider because the region of the Umpqua Valley is larger. We also have more elevational differences and latitudinal differences. So we have a bigger climate uh, envelope, but we do overlap. We have some characteristic climates uh, that are very similar to Burgundy and some that are a little similar to Bordeaux as well. So this leads me to talk about climate change. A lot of well-documented changes that have happened out there uh, uh, in terms of climate and, and climate controlled factors in wine regions. Uh, we know that uh, growing seasons have gotten warmer and longer. We know that winter periods have been uh, uh, warmer as well. The plants are telling us that things are changing because they have earlier bud break and flowering and harvest. We also know that ripening characteristics or profiles have changed. Uh, we've been uh, accumulating more sugar and producing slightly higher alcohol wines uh, and therefore wine styles have changed because of it. Pests and diseases have changed. We've also seen some changes overall in characteristics of soil erosion and fertility. But we've also seen water uh, resource changes where some places have gotten drier and some places have, have gotten wetter. But let's look at a very basic change, getting back to this diagram that we've just been talking about and put it into a framework of trying to understand how changes in climate influence not only how varieties can be produced, but how regions can produce those varieties uh, based upon their climate envelope. I'm going to go back to Burgundy. Burgundy in the 1950s was relatively cool, cooler than it is today. And it was still able to produce Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, its two marquee varieties, but did it in a slightly different wine style framework. If you, of course, fast forward to where we are today, you can see that that shift of a couple of degrees is more central to those two varieties and so therefore allows it to be uh, uh, produced more consistently. If we look at conservative estimates of warming in the future, Burgundy will likely end up here. The climatic envelope will be on the warm upper end for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It doesn't remove them from the ability to produce those wines, but what it does is it changes the wine style overall framework that they can produce there. Um, if, we, if we look at this though, this is a conservative projection of climate in the future. What happens if it changes to more extremes that we kind of th tend to think might happen? This would put Burgundy in a completely different framework, where only the coolest of places can potentially uh, ripen fruit in the future, um, and potentially there will be other varieties that can be done there. How about if we go to where we are again here in the Umpqua Valley and think about it. We go back to the 1950s in the Umpqua Valley. The climates were a little cooler than they are today. The first pioneers that came here in the 1960s planted varieties that were more so associated with that cooler climate and did fairly well. Fast forward to today, this is our climate envelope. We still produce some of those cool climate varieties, but now we have shifted a little bit and we're producing uh, other varieties. How about conservative warming in the growing seasons of four to five degrees Fahrenheit by 2050? This is what our climate envelope would be like. We would be shifting a little bit in terms of what we can do, but we'd also be opening up uh, potentially to new varieties in terms of our overall productivity capability. 
So that leads me to the idea of what does the future hold? Well, first, we know that today climate is warmer than any time in our recorded past. We also know that continued warming is highly likely. While climate change has the ability to affect every single agricultural pursuit, the narrow zones of, of wine grape production are especially prone to climate change, and so have provided us some good evidence of kind of these type of impacts into a specialty crop system. Uh, so as we look forward to the future, we have to think a little bit about kind of what this means for the overall perspective of wine grape growing. We know that the past uh, 50 years have benefited quality of wine worldwide with some climate change, but our projections into the future have a tendency to uh, point to the idea that some beneficial impacts will happen, but we'll likely have some detrimental impacts as well. I personally believe that Oregon has plenty to gain from overall climate change, and I think that we'll see some of that. Our, uh, our warming in our cool to intermediate climates will likely produce uh, a situation in which we have increased viability for some varieties, but we can also potentially see new varieties that we can grow. However, our warm and dry summers are projected to nothing, get nothing more than warmer and drier. And what that might do is that might in, increase heat stress and or increase uh, issues of water resource uh, demand. So I think we have some real important issues there. I have a lot of confidence in viticulture and wine production to, uh, to address these issues. They already have in increasing their sustainability and are constantly looking to uh, uh, reduce their vulnerability and increase their adaptive capacity in face of climate change. They're doing this through uh, looking at better plant material, how to better manage vineyards, but also how to take that fruit from the vineyard into the winery and control quality into the future. All of that being said, I think all of us as wine consumers need to be adaptable to change as well. Um, Change is going to happen, whether it be changes in wine styles or wine varieties. This is just bound to happen in all the wine regions in the world. If you are a true terroirist and you love wine, then embrace these changes. Go out there and continually try to find the best wine you can find from the magic that is terroir. Thank you.